It's time for Declare Your Independence with Ernest Hancock. Believe me when I say we have a difficult time ahead of us. But if we are to be prepared for it, we must first shed our fear of it. I stand here without fear because I remember. I remember that I am here not because of the path that lies before me, but because of the path that lies behind me. I remember that for 100 years we have fought these machines. And after a century of war, I remember that which matters most. We are still here! Welcome to Declare Your Independence with me, Ernest Hancock, each and every day here on the LRN.FM network from Phoenix, Arizona, here at the farm of Freedoms with an S, freedomsphoenix.com. Today, I'm going to introduce you to uh, someone we haven't had on for a while, and I want to tell you his story, because here is a gentleman that knows what it's like where war meets the ground. We had in 2001... Don Brudeau gave a speech at the, our first Freedom Summit. Don Brudeau is a, an economist, and, and he came to speak on a lot of things. But I remember one thing that he said. He said that bombs being dropped on people are just little puffs of smoke. You're a World War II, you know, a B-17 bomber, B-29. You're out there dropping the bombs, and all you see is just little puffs of smoke. You're not down on the ground where you've seen blown bodies, you know, splattered up against walls. I have never forgot that imagery that he put into my head is that our foreign policy for the vast majority of us is just little puffs of smoke or smart bombs falling down chimneys over and over. Where war really hits the ground, there has, you know, until recently in the Internet generation, there was not the firsthand standing there description of what was happening. Well, that changed during the bombardment of Baghdad. There was a family, Gerard, and it's Raed Gerard is my guest. Now, I want to introduce you a little. I got, Raed, I got you there? Yes. I want, to, I want to give me a little bit just to get them caught up on who you are and what made you so prominent, certainly in my mind, and we'll get into some of the uh, issues of today. He was born in Iraq. He's raised in Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and Iraq. And he is half Iraqi, half Palestinian. He holds a degree in, in uh, I'm sorry, in architecture and from the University of Baghdad, but you got a master's degree in architectural engineering specializing in post war reconstruction from the University of Jordan. Now, let me tell you the first thing that pops out. They got a, deg a degree in post-war reconstruction. I thought they just called Bechtel, you know, or Halliburton, and uh, they had all the degrees they needed. So it, it just is amazing that they have a specialty in post-war reconstruction now, if that alone isn't scary enough. So then you have, while he was uh, attending there, he met another gentleman, his name uh, in the uh, University of Baghdad, Salem Pax. Now, there was a blog. It's like, where is Raed? And it was just about his family's experience there in Baghdad during the bombardment. And it wasn't just you, Raed. It was, I think, your mother and uh, had a brother and or sister kind of around the Middle East. And it was your perspective on what was happening as the bombs were falling and we were enraptured. We followed it. We had you on the radio. We talked about what was happening. And now we're going to get to the point to where I want you to go ahead and share with the audience how the book, the Iraq War blog, an Iraqi family's inside view of the first year of occupation. Let's go ahead and skip up to the publishing of that book and the impact that it had, and then we'll get into current news. Would, would, you, would you do that for me? Yeah, sure. Well, thank you for having me on your show again. And uh, thanks for the very uh, generous uh, 
introduction. I'm not sure I deserve all of it. Um, I think uh, from the time that I turned from uh, 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 an architect uh, in Baghdad uh, into uh, a blogger and a political advocate uh, in D.C., uh, this journey that I went through, uh, it helps me uh, see how the war looks like from both ends. Uh, the end that receives the bombs, as you were mentioning them, mentioning how how like uh, being on the ground and uh, receiving the the bombs in your neighborhood is different than seeing them from the airplane or TV, and from the end that justifies wars here in Washington D.C., the war machine that justifies wars and uh, and actually uh, uh, survives by prolonging wars and spending money on wars. So this journey that I went through, I think, um, changed uh, a lot of my world perspective and my understandings of events. And I always try to uh, share my uh, thoughts and uh, and the recent events that happened uh, with me here in D.C. or what I see in Iraq uh, with others through my blog or uh, I try to write on other uh, publications. Uh, and I think our our joint book, uh, the one that uh, my mother and brother and myself self-published a few years ago, uh, was meant to give a snapshot of how Iraq looked like uh, under the, uh, the U.S. occupation during the first year. Uh, because I think many of the things that we uh, believe in now, like, for example, now the majority of Americans realize that uh, uh, this war was not successful in uh, building a, a prosperous and stable Iraq. Uh, many people believe that the war was costly to both Iraqis and Americans. And many other things that became a part of our collective wisdom here in the U.S. Uh, when you read the book, you realize that these things were indeed a part of the Iraqi collective wisdom from 2003 because people saw things on the ground and they, they experienced things firsthand rather than watching them uh, through uh, the U.S. mainstream media's lens that was very distorted, of course. Well, tell me, what was one of the big things that you think America got wrong? As the populace watched the cable news 24 hour forever cycle of you know the same bomb dropping down the same chimney kind of thing you know what was it that on the ground you going if america only knew what was really going on can you pick out one or two main things that you think uh we would be surprised by and horrified by i mean you know the death dying in destruction or was it the roadblocks or was it the mines or was it the marauding militias? Was it, I mean, what was the couple of things that you thought that we should know about? One thing, I think there is one thing that always strikes me uh, as surprising that the American uh, public did not know about is that people uh, uh, thought and uh, many of them still think that there is an answer to the question how can we occupy Iraq successfully? I do not think there is a way to, uh, to uh, occupy Iraq, uh, to implement a foreign military occupation in a successful and peaceful and prosperous way. So you see, my point there is that uh, what happened in Iraq was not a military occupation that has gone wrong because of some tactics or some policies on the ground, or only if we did not dismantle the Iraqi army, only if we did not uh, do this or do that, our occupation would have been successful. You know, that is a myth. Occupations, by nature, are uh, violent and destructive. And I think the thing that we would have gotten right is not occupy Iraq. When we come back with Raed Jarrar, we're going to talk about the occupation where we and where we are now, because the Romans taught us something that we should have remembered. Conquer is easy. Control is not. We'll be right back here on Declare Your Independence in just a little bit.